Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Competency-Based Talent Development. My name is Luciano Gregoretti. I am a consultant here at Talent First, and I will be conducting today's session. The webinar will last for about 30 minutes, um, during which I will walk you through some best practices, guidelines, and practical examples of how Fortune 500 companies use competency models for talent development. Before we begin with uh, today's session, I'd like to remind you that this is um, a webinar part of a larger series called Seven Steps to Building Top Performing Organizations Using Competency Models. The goal of this program is to share part of our experience and best practices on creating integrated talent management processes that are based on competency models. The reasons why um, we decided to conduct this webinar series come both from a problem and an opportunity. The problem is that all too often companies spend a lot of time and money developing competency models, but they, they don't really use them to their fullest potential. On the other hand, uh, the opportunity comes from the greater results that company achieve when their talent management systems are aligned and integrated. In the previous webinar uh, that you can uh, watch for the first time or rewatch um, on a Talent First YouTube page, we provided with uh, practical, practical guidelines to create competency models that not only are um, scientifically valid, but they're also actionable and easy to apply. As I said before, today um, we will focus on processes, best practices, and guidelines to use competency models for developing your people. So why do companies invest in development? We do development to help our people performing more effectively in their jobs. On an individual perspective, um, development allows people to accelerate and focus their natural learning process and ac acquire skills necessary to achieve better results. If you watched our last webinar, we define competencies as skills, knowledge, and abilities applied for specific outcomes. So competency models, if valid, um, identify behaviors that are linked to top performance. By developing people against those competencies, what you're doing, you're positioning them as the best as possible to achieve better results. So developing competencies impacts on business results also in a more, uh, I'd say, indirect way uh, by boosting that powerful motivation and status also known as work engagement. Dutch organizational psychologist Wilmar Schofeli identified that developing skills is one of the uh, main predictors of work engagement. What this means is that a well-designed development system can contribute to reducing turnover, increasing productivity, and also reducing risks or burnout and work-related stress as part of the outcomes of the work engagement. So all good reasons to take development uh, seriously. So I'm sure you've seen this slide before uh, in all shapes and sizes, um, but if I brought it up today is because um, I think it's still relevant. In fact, many times when we talk about development, we still think, uh, I'd say almost automatically, about training, formal training. Um, formal off-the-job training is only one and not always the best solution to develop organizations and people. Formal training alone is not as effective as it could be if paired with other on-the-job activities. Um, these developmental actions, um, such as special assignments, um, development in place, uh, job rotations, can really multiply the effectiveness of a single um, training course. One powerful approach um, we recommend is combining training with continuous feedback and on-the-job activities. But training itself can be more or less effective 
depending on how well is aligned with the overall business strategy. Unfortunately, uh, most training tends to be uh, reactive instead of strategic. As a best practice, we recommend that you provide your organization and people with thoughtful, targeted, competency-based training to optimize ROI. Now, this may sound logical and maybe for uh, some of you that are with us today even rudimentary, uh, but more times than not, we find training assets are not aligned to competencies. We recently developed a field coaching report uh, for an organization with the goal being to link it to training offered by the company. While they were strong advocates of their competencies, uh, their training was actually misaligned and I'd say all over the board. In fact, they were using seven separate uh, LMS, learning management systems, that housed their training contacts. This was so confusing and unfocused that training uh, was actually ignored by people uh, and their managers. So really competency models um, can make training uh, more aligned, focused, and accessible to people and managers in your organization. So the first step uh, that you need to take to develop uh, people using competency models is assessing where people are against the model. Um, there are various uh, approaches to do that. There could be um, actually an entire discussion about different methodologies to apprise skills, knowledge, and abilities. Uh, but today, we're going to focus on the approach um, that is frequently used by Fortune 500 companies, which I think is also probably one of the most cost-effective. So we call this method uh, competency proficiency assessment. But let's step back for a second just to make sure that we're all aligned with uh, the vocabulary. So a good and valid competency model is broken out into a progression of what we call proficiency stages that allow to separate the different levels of know-how in a specific competency. An example is a progression of four stages, uh, learning, applying, leading, and expert, but it could be customized uh, according to the needs and the culture of specific organizations. Um, the assessment is really finalized to identify in which of those proficiency stages is a person against the entire model or part of the model. The process is quite simple. The employee rates himself and is rated by the manager on the model to assign current level of skills, knowledge, and ability. The output is a quantitative view of the proficiency stages according to the competency model that is then used for developmental purposes. The feedback itself plays an important role in development because it increases self-awareness. To this point, um, I would recommend you to read a research conducted by Zess and Landis called uh, A Better Return on Self-Awareness that basically shows how self-awareness is correlated to better individual and organizational performance, which ultimately improve financial results. Um, another advantage of the proficiency assessment is that it provides leadership with a dashboard of current capabilities uh, that can be incorporated into talent planning and or development, um, as I will actually show you um, in, the last, um, in, in a later segment of this presentation. Now, I will show you um, some guidelines and principles again, uh, around the proficiency assessment. Um, first of all, rule number one, uh, we recommend to clearly communicate to your people the exclusive developmental purposes of the assessment. Employees must know that this process is separated from the performance appraisal and it will not be considered for compensation purposes. When you create a model, um, we also recommend to conduct the proficiency assessment as the first activity after launching. Um, starting, for example, with uh, another process like the performance management. Um, 
it's probably something that you should avoid. And the reason, the reason to me is quite obvious. Um, instead of perceiving the utility of the model for their professional development, people will actually feel uh, threatened by it. So conduct the proficiency assessment as the first activity after launching a model and do it within the first 30 days. Rule number three, conduct the, uh, the assessment using observations of consistent demonstration of those behaviors that are specified in the model. Both managers and employees need to bring examples of consistent and effective behaviors to sustain their judgments. Um, another point, tenure does not always equal expert. So hopefully your competency model um, is always raising the performance bar in your organization. Therefore, if someone has been in the role for a long period of time, even 15 years, that does not necessarily mean that he or she would be on a leading or expert stage uh, because the environment changes and you're continually, continuously increasing expectations. Another best practice is to repeat your assessment no more than two times a year. In fact, you need to leave people enough time to develop their competencies. The consistent demonstration of new skills, knowledge, and abilities does not happen overnight. Um, we recommend to conduct the proficiency assessment with um, an automated software because it takes away a tremendous amount of uh, administrative time that would be otherwise extremely disruptive for a single person. And here is a typical layout of a, an automated system which also happened to be our cloud-based talent management software uh, called iCoach First. This screenshot um, is uh, used for the evaluation phase. So um, on, the top, um, on the top left, you have the competency dimension, sales aptitude. Uh, then you can see the two uh, success factors for that competency and the proficiency levels, proficiency stages uh, that's a, that I was telling you uh, before. So right now, uh, I am the employee, um, and I will fill my self-evaluation. So what I do, I would read uh, the behaviors that define each proficiency level, and I select those uh, that I, I think I showed more consistently. And remember that people need to be consistently demonstrating the specific behaviors to be assigned or to assign themselves uh, to a particular proficiency stage. So the key is consistency. Then my manager uh, will do the same process and assess my proficiency stage in the same competency dimension. And here is an example of a competency proficiency assessment report of an overall competency model, which shows the result um, on an aggregate perspective. So here we have the name of uh, manager and direct report on the top left side of uh, your screen. Um, then there are instructions for managers and their direct reports to help them read the results properly. Moving down, you can see the assessment cycle, in this case, open in September 2012. And finally, the proficiency levels. You can see uh, the ratings of the manager uh, in blue, and in yellow is the self-rating um, completed by the employee. And this is an example of a competency proficiency assessment report of a specific competency. So before we saw the overall uh, results on the uh, entire competency model, and um, this is actually of a single specific competency dimension. Uh, so we have the definition on the top left. Uh, moving down, you can see the three success factors. And then the proficiency um, level for each of the success factors, both assessed by employee and manager. Um, and at the end of the report, uh, there is a space for comments both uh, for manager and employee to support their evaluation. And remember that 
documenting an assessment with direct observation is the only way to make this process valid and credible. So another way to look at the results of a proficiency assessment is by rolling up the information on a team level. This use of the assessment gives you an organizational snapshot of gaps and strengths on a broader level. This competency dashboard is a powerful resource uh, for HR and leadership in order to make data-driven data decisions and optimize workforce investments. Now, today we're focusing on development, but competency management allows HR to make strategic and proactive decisions in other talent management areas, including hiring. Uh, for example, if an entire department lack, uh, lacks of um, a critical competency, hiring talent with that competency uh, might be a great solution, um, especially if coupled with a targeted development plan and a competency-based training curriculum. So this page is an extract of a project we did uh, with a sales organization a couple of years ago. On the x-axis, uh, we have the success factors, which, um, as you say, are the main components of competencies. On the y-axis, you can see the proficiency stages. So three different teams were rated for each of those success factors. And here are the compare results. From this graph, um, we notice, for example, that um, Team 1 and Team 2 display similar proficiency levels in most competencies. So they're pretty similar. On the other hand, uh, if we look at Team 2, we see that uh, it differs substantially uh, by the other teams. Um, while there seem to, they seem to be uh, very capable in coaching and cross-function of partnering, for example, they have an evident developmental need in other competency dimensions such as performance and results driven as well as business planning and insights. So you can see how effective uh, could be this type of analysis to prioritize development investment and make sound data-driven decisions. Another way to conduct um, competency analysis is by comparing teams uh, or the same team over time. This exercise can be executed with the purpose of understanding progresses over a period of time um, and evaluate also the effectiveness of training and development. Okay, so um, in the following session section, um, we will take a closer look of competency development on uh, an individual perspective. So we said before that uh, we begin a development plan with competency proficiency assessment. And this is the best practice to make the development plan targeted and focused. It also provides the managers and HR with a tool to monitor progresses toward the achievement of desired results evaluate the effectiveness of the program, and understand if changes are needed in the overall process. The next phase um, is a developmental discussion, finalized to identify competency target, agree on a developmental goal or multiple developmental goals, and establish a proper plan to achieve that goal. So during the implementation phase, uh, manager and direct report should have both formal and informal continuous bidirectional feedback processes. At the end of this process, the assessment should be reconducted to evaluate the achievement of the desired goals. Um, now, until the development discussion phase, um, I can say that we see companies being usually um, pretty diligent. Where we see them falling short are actually the following two steps. Um, in this situation, uh, the managers should really take the role of a coach. Um, the manager needs to be able to co-design a development plan, ensure commitment, and remove barriers, um, and when needed, provide motivational support. 
by limiting uh, the developmental program exclusively on assessment and feedback, the risk is to restrict the opportunities of improvement and the overall uh, effectiveness of the process. So here are some best practices um, to make your competency development plans more effective. Now, um, you cannot work on everything. Developing new behaviors takes time, take net, takes energy, take different type of resources. You cannot expect an individual to increase uh, four or five skills in 12 months. The best practice, um, again used by Fortune 500 companies, is to focus on maximum uh, two key areas at the time. So how do we choose which competencies we should focus on? Uh, there is not a right recipe, uh, but we can provide you with a few guidelines. Um, competencies need to be relevant for the individual, first of all. Uh, if the competency target is important for the employee um, and for his uh, or her professional development, then um, the employee would be highly motivated and, commitment, um, and committed in the development process. But a competency target needs to be relevant for the organization and their role as well. Um, a Fortune 500 company we've consulted uh, about a year ago identify a lack of business acumen among their sales managers, which were were, um, was preventing them from identifying and capitalizing on very important opportunities. So they were losing money. Uh, the sales directors, together with training in HR, agreed on the necessity of filling this gap as soon as possible. So all sales managers um, were assigned with development plans focused on the competency area of business acumen. So it's usually a matter of finding the right balance between individual needs, individual aspirations, and organization needs and goals. Um, we've been hearing a lot in the past years that focusing on strengths is the best way to maximize attainments of development goals. Um, well, uh, developing strengths um, is definitely very important. We also recommend to focus on weaknesses as well. And also, development should never occur in a vacuum. We advocate temporal continuity in the development process. So we got to look at the future and we got to look at the past. Um, for instance, if an individual has been working on his negotiation skills for five years, uh, then maybe it's time to move on with something else. Or um, if an employee would be likely to make a vertical or a lateral move, uh, you might want to focus on skills that would be critical also for the future position. So the key components of development plans are, of course, the activities. We mentioned before, um, as a common mistake, is to uh, limit development activities to formal training models. So training, if, either if it's delivered in a classroom setting or online through learning models, is a valid method to try new skills in a protected and experimental environment. But if training is used as the only developmental resource, then um, the impact on development and uh, results is actually limited. So I know it might sound um, pretty obvious for, um, for most of you today, but blended learning is the way to go to see real results and impact on business. So coaching, on-the-job activities, job rotations, uh, special assignments are just some of the valid approaches that you should consider when designing a development plan. And here is how competency-based developmental activities uh, can be assigned. So on the top left of your screen, um, you can see the competency target with the proficiency stage. Uh, then there is a space for behavior examples of the identified stage uh, and another space for developmental tips. So down there are activities, uh, the activities that can be assigned. For example, here we have a um, simple link to an article 
uh, an e-learning program and a special assignment, so an off-the-job, uh, on-the-job activity. And here is an example of a competency development plan based on an hypothetic case. It's a story about Frank. Uh, Frank is a customer service specialist that works for a large manufacturing company. Uh, he's been in this role for three years and he's highly considered by his manager who wants him to be promoted. So they conduct a proficiency assessment and identify that communication skill um, is the competency target to develop in order to move on with this career. In particular, they agreed that the success factor design and deliver presentations uh, was um, the one most critical considering its actual proficiency level and the expectations from the future role. So the solution to fill Frank's competency gap consisted in a multi-staged and blended learning. The first step was a half-day classroom training where Frank was exposed to some uh, new techniques to design and deliver presentations. <clears throat> I'm sorry. After the training, um, he was assigned uh, with a presentation that he had to prepare by applying the techniques that he learned in the classroom. And after the presentation, uh, Frank collected feedback from the crowd and then he discussed the results with his manager. He was then assigned to a special project. Specifically, um, his main role was to deliver the kickoff, ongoing and final presentations to top leaders. This developmental activity allowed him to move uh, his presentation skills uh, to another proficiency stage as well as being noticed by senior leadership. Um, and at the end of the project, Frank was reassessed against uh, the competency model, obtaining the desired results. So we are um, at the end of uh, today's presentation, uh, but before uh, we close the webinar, I would like to remind that uh, the next webinar of the series using competency models to hire top talent will be online on uh, July 8th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time and July 10th at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. If you haven't registered yet, you will find the links in your registration email or visiting our website www.talentfirst.com. Thank you for being with us today and I hope to see you on board for the next webinars.